This is AUGforums.com Real Talk, an unfiltered and independent perspective on Acumatica Cloud ERP. First, thank you to our sponsors, Repay, DataSelf, and Velixo. Please take a minute to support this podcast by clicking each one of the sponsor banners located at AUGforums.com slash sponsors. Our sponsors track clicks, and every click helps to support this podcast. My name is Tim Rodman, and I want to mention two more things in this pre-recorded intro before we get started. First, I'm always looking for victims, ahem, I mean guests, on the podcast. If you use Acumatica in any capacity, no matter how small, I'd love to talk with you check out AUGforums.com slash podcast and click the link near the top of the page to learn about being a guest on the podcast. Second, I'd love to see you listed on my Rolodex. Check out the instructions at AUGforums.com slash Rolodex to see how you can add yourself to the list. All right, that's it for the pre-recorded intro. Let's get started. Today is Tuesday, December 7th, 2021, and this is episode number 59, AccuStock, a warehousing mobile app for MYOB and Acumatica with Michael Wallace. And because Michael is in, it's Sydney, right? That's right. Sydney, Australia. Uh, It's 10 o'clock his time. It's 6 a.m. my time. And normally I don't wake up early enough for a 6 a.m. podcast, but this AccuStock act looked pretty interesting to me, so I was willing to uh, to do it. I'll take a longer nap today. <laughs> <laughs> you had a few coffees? Uh, I, I had my Diet Mountain Dew uh, to get me ready for this, <laughs> and hopefully oh. the kids upstairs don't hear me talking. But the uh, point is I, I was willing to uh, bend my, my normal routine to, to hear about this. So thanks for coming on, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Thanks, Tim. Um, uh, name's Michael, 30 years old, uh, li- live and grew up in Sydney, Australia. Um, uh, I started um, my uh, career in software development um, a bit different to a lot of other people because I, uh, I left school and then I did some tertiary education and then I actually decided to start up my own IT support business. And I did that for about uh, four or five years. Um, But during that time, I started to pick up um, web development and slowly my client base started transitioning from, you know, IT support customers over to uh, web application design and development. Um, And about six years ago, I was employed by a company um, sort of just in the midst of a a bit of an IT overhaul. Um, And that's where I got uh, to know about Acumatica um, and also... um, uh, e-commerce platform uh, Magento. Um, so that's what I've been doing for the last uh, five or six years now. So was that your first foray into ERP? Is that the first time you had even heard of ERP? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Um, and it was definitely a lot of learning. Um, you know, learning of new, uh, new, new framework as well as a new programming language, um, and. Uh, also uh, picked up a, no- a lot of knowledge about, you know, finance and um, business operations, stuff that I, I, I uh, had a little bit of experience in, but not, a, not as, uh, you know, at a depth that I did during that job. And what, what was the first hook? Was it the, I assume the e-commerce side, since you were on the web app side, is that, was that kind of the first thing that kind of roped you into the world of ERP? No, um, actually, it, it all started off, well, I guess there's, there's, there's two things. that It started off by me designing websites for clients. And, you know, sometimes those websites would need, uh, you know, functionality like booking systems, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, uh, credit card payments, stuff like that. Um, but also in my spare time, I quite enjoyed uh, software development. So, you know, I was developing Android apps. Um, I developed a, um, uh, uh, an open source point of sale system. Um, 
So I, I guess I guess uh, that sort of career path stemmed for from my love of open source software, um, and, and just just you know really being interested in in software development and and you know just what gets me about software developer is the only tool you need is a com computer, right? As long as you've got a computer, you don't need any any other resources. You don't need any other costs. It's just you and the keyboard, and you can build something that helps people, that that makes people's lives easier. So that's sort of what drew me into the software development field. Yeah, I like that too. It's not like real estate; you need a ton of capital to get in. You just uh, absolutely need, yeah. need time and a curiosity, I guess. Um, yeah. I, I guess on the ERP side, I'm curious. Like, you know, you were doing uh, web applications and it, was there something that drew you in? I, I find like for me personally, getting into the ERP space, uh, it's just interesting problems and the business side is interesting. It's just not all technical. Like, like it can be with, um, when you're just doing development to me, getting into the ERP space, you're getting into business process and learning how businesses work. Was that something that attracted yeah. you or is just, it was the problem that was presented to you and maybe there was a market for it and that's why you stuck with it. Well, actually I got into um, e-commerce uh, development before I started this job and I was employed mainly to do that. But as I was starting that job, they were thinking, you know, this is a, a sort of a medium sized company I'm talking about and they were using very outdated IT systems. So um, it was at the time where they were just looking at ERP systems. Um, so I played a major role in, in the implementation and the eventual rollout of um, uh, MYB Advanced, which is what Acumatica essentially is in Australia. It's a, a wire labeled variant. Oh, see, I didn't realize you, you weren't just developing then. You, you really got involved with the implementation as well. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we had a great partner, but a, a lot of it was left to us. Um, um, so things like integrating the website with with the new platform, um, things like uh, designing reports. Um, uh, what else? Um, uh, warehousing applications, for instance. Um, our partner did uh, provide some solutions, but um, in the long long term, they just didn't work out. So. Um, that's when I started looking at possibly writing in-house um, software that we could really tailor to our needs. And it, it could just be because, you know, MYOB is usually, I'm not sure, a, a version maybe behind Acumatica. Uh, Acumatica does have their own warehouse mobile app now. Uh, I don't know if it's even available yeah, for MYOB. So I, Did I you look at that, that and... Yeah, well, that that actually came out probably six months after I developed. Um, oh, okay, okay, right. And I I did look at it, and and I was I was kind of annoyed at first because I saw they'd brought out this new new um you know mobile app, and I I had a look at it, but at the end of the day, I was sort of glad that I went ahead and developed my own thing, um, because because of the type of of warehousing that we were doing. So even even now, when you look at it, you're like. You know, there there were still reasons why it it's advantageous to have our own thing. Absolutely, yeah. Ah, okay. So let's get into that. So, like, uh, what what were? Yeah, I guess you know to start off chronologically, maybe aside from the Acumatica mobile app, you know what what identified or what made people say, hey, we need a, a mobile app for our warehousing, and you know how that conversation come about. Yep. So um, from the very start, that was a, a really important um, item on our implementation list. Um, uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we were trialing some software um, from through our partner. Um, You've probably heard of them. I'm not gonna not gonna say their name. I don't want to shame anybody. Uh, but uh, during that during that testing phase, we we realised that there were quite a few flaws. Um, we were at, at that stage, we were going ahead and we were going to use the handheld component of that solution. Uh, but there's no way that we would have been able to use the packing station. Um, so that's the AccuStock is actually the second component. Um, the first component I built was actually a packing station that allowed uh, the warehouse staff to put in package details. Um, uh, 
shipment costs um, and, and, you know, save and confirm the shipment. And that we later linked that into um, carriers so that we could print labels directly out from that software and oh, also generate things like um, uh, commercial invoices for cross-border trade uh, and, um, you know, that sort of stuff. Packing slips also does uh, barcode label printing. Um, so it's basically... It's basically anything that this handheld software couldn't do uh, is handled by this packing station software, which I very confusingly called uh, AccuShip as opposed to AccuStock. And and is that like a that's built in the Acumatica framework and sits on the server, or where does that piece? Sit? No, it's I actually I wanted to get that done fast, so I actually used the Magento framework of all things oh. just to speed up development and have have a you know a platform where I could build an API quickly, um, you know, a place to store, store config values and stuff like that. So that's just a web app that connects through uh, a Magento sort of API surro surrogate and then back through to the um, Acumatica API. Interesting. And you said it was AccuShip. AccuShip, yeah. Okay. Well, the name doesn't sound that bad to me. <laughs> uh, on, on name, so I have to say, uh, I've got a Google Android phone. And if I go out to my app store, Google store, and I search for Acumatica and people who are way too geeky about Acumatica do things like that every now and then just to see what's out there. And there's not that many things out there, but AccuStock is one of those things um, where since, since you brought up AccuShip, is there a, oh, and I should also mention, you can talk about the open source side of this and why it's open source. Is AccuShip somewhere out there that people can download or how's that part work? No, unfortunately not. Um, it would actually take quite a lot of preparation to get it um, into a state that, you know, everybody could use it uh, easily. Um, so it probably, probably, um, probably means stripping out the, the Magento part of it and building a new API and also stripping out some of, some of the custom stuff that I put in for that company. Um, okay. Stuff that nobody else would benefit from, and uh, you know, wouldn't you know the fields? Uh, you know, it pulls data from fields which wouldn't exist in a standard Acumatica installation. So there's there'd possibly need to be some uh, Acuma Acumatica customization to go along with that. Gotcha. Be before we do dive in then to the AccuStock piece, uh, the open source and all that, um, you mentioned carrier integration. So that happens on the AccuShip side? It does, yeah. Um, and that's not the standard carrier integration that Acumatica does, that you built your own thing? No, and I, I believe that's actually something that MYB strips out. Uh, I'd have to oh, check that. But, okay. Uh, I remember going in there and having a look at building a, a carrier plugin for Acumatica, um, but it, it wasn't in the uh, enabled features uh, list. Okay. So. I'm curious um, about it because, um, I mean, I have no idea. In Australia, what are the main carriers down there? Oh, you've got Australia Post and then you've got, you, you do have FedEx and DHL and stuff for, for overseas, but it's mainly Australia Post for domestic shipments. So which, is that what you did, just Australia Post? No, we actually went with integrating with a service called uh, Easy Post. You might have heard of it, but I have heard of that. Yeah, it's essentially a developer-focused API platform for integrating with um, multiple carriers. So you integrate with the Easy Post API, and then you just add your carrier accounts into Easy Post, and um, you know you can print labels from. I think they support about more than a hundred carriers, and most of the ones that that you would use, that most people would use as well, at least in uh, uh, USA and Australia. Okay. Yeah, the reason I was curious about that is I know like with FedEx and UPS, uh, which are popular ones in the US, um, you know, when you set that up in Acumatica, it's it's still weird to me because you have to go essentially become a, a software vendor in the eyes of UPS and FedEx. And you have to go sign up and go through a test yeah. account and all that. And I, I was wondering if you had gone through that process and what it was like for you. <laughs> uh, like, I'm also for used you. to trying to get yeah, I'm all too used to trying to get um, API credentials from carriers. They they have very archaic platforms, and it's it's often like that. You know, um, it's not like they they don't have anything modern like OAuth where you can just you know allow software X software to access your UPS account. 
but you found easy post was pretty easy to work with. They take oh, care easy of post the is a great platform. Um, and you know, it's, it's free. Uh, there's, there's plenty of other platforms, um, that do sort of a, a similar thing. Um, but what drew us to easy post is that they support multi-package shipping, which believe it or not, there's a lot of similar solutions that don't support multiple packaging. Um, and it's free for up to 120,000 parcels per year. Um, so oh, it's interesting. Yes. So um, I, I don't know how they're doing that. Um, I appreciate it. That's for sure. Um, but I suggest that they probably have um, some partnerships with carriers or some big enterprises to make that possible. Interesting. So when you say multiple packages, you mean being able to know that they're related together on one shipment in Acumatica and Correct. it's multiple. Yeah. So it's a, a single consignment or shipment with multiple parcels. Okay. Interesting. Okay. It just stuns me why uh, so many of these similar platforms just don't have that functionality. Um, well, probably just designed for lower, that. smaller places, right? And uh, they don't have that complexity need maybe. Yeah, yeah. You're probably right about that, but probably they've, probably left out that key detail from the start and it's just a really difficult job to to make that transition well i'm glad you mentioned it and i'm glad you mentioned the 120,000 too it's it's those kind of details that we go for here on uh, augforums.com real talk <laughs> that's right like and if any, anybody out there wants to develop a, uh, an easy post uh plug-in for acumatica directly i'm sure a lot of people would appreciate that and maybe uh, you could be the person to do that. And I guess with that, what, you know, what, what do you do now? Are you still like independent? Are you working for that company that you started into? Yeah, the so I've, I've left that previous job. So I'm sort of just in a transition at the moment. I've left that previous job. I've just been working on a few uh, contract jobs, uh, Magento 2 mainly. Um, also some, some jobs for, for the old company as well. Uh, but I'm looking to uh, get a new full-time job next year. So maybe if someone hears this in the next uh, couple of weeks and they're interested in Easy Post, could that be you? Or maybe you, you, you uh, got too much on your no, plate. No, right I've now. I've got some other interests I'm looking at at the moment. Okay, okay, no problem, no problem. Um, all right, so I, I like the actual ship stuff. The, the carrier integration is what caught my attention there. But I guess since that is uh, that was a huge time saver, um, and also also um, you know accuracy. Um, you know, it just means, just means that, you know, mistakes copying over those address details to the carry portal can't happen. Um, and it's just a, a nice integrated experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I love, I love interfacing with real world uh, devices like receipt printers and, and stuff like that. That's always interested me. Interesting. What, what about, so I'll foray even further under this tangent. What about IOT devices? You got an interest there? Oh yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, I guess the last hobby project that I I, I worked on that's it's, it's quite a while ago now, but I, I built a, a little uh, um, IoT sprinkler gardening gardening watering system, which I used to water my plants. Okay, so that so that's they don't cool. die when I go away. That's cool. <laughs> And then how does it, is it all built into the code, the schedule and all that? Or do you put a nice little, oh, I, I didn't, I didn't write the code for that one. I just built the hardware and well, I didn't build the hard, like it's a, a open sprinkler. So open source sprinkler system. And I, I built the, um, you know, the valve array and, and, and the uh, pumps and stuff like that. Oh, that's put really that cool. I think you would enjoy an Acumatica hackathon, but that, that would be a long flight to get there for that. <laughs> Probably, but you know, you never know. I've always thought about going over there for some of the, um, you know, Def, DefCon and and Black Hat conferences. They look fun. <laughs> that's cool. So AccuShip, that that's interesting, but sounds like that's kind of, you know, just packaged up uh, something that people couldn't get access to. But AccuStock, and I think this is actually where I first saw it, if I remember right, was another thing I do sometimes is search Acumatica over on GitHub which is open source stuff. Acumatica has a lot out there. And I think that's where I first came across AccuStock. So maybe you talk a little bit about what made you go open source? How'd you get that permission? What motivated you to do it? Because it's out there on GitHub. 
Um, yeah, so like a lot of my projects, they, they start um, out of frustration. Well, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them have. Um, and so we, we implemented Acumatica um, and it, it was a, an intense time for about six months after that, you know, writing reports that were forgotten about, um, you know, fixing little bugs and, and, um, and, and training. I mean, people don't realise that training is really just a big ticket item with any, any major IT migration. Um, and I don't think people realise that when, when they start these implementations that, especially with an ERP system, because it touches every department, you know, it's not just changing something up for finance. It's, it's changing up <clears throat> everything, you know, in the warehouse, in sales, um, in uh, reporting um, for, for CEOs and stuff like that. So, um, and, and a real pain point was the handheld software that we chose to go with. Um, and eventually it got to the point where it, it, it was taking, uh, taking, you know, hours out of my week. Uh, a big chunk of hours out of my week just supporting this software. Um, and that's when I approached management and, and got them to agree that we, we needed to, to, um, to look at something else. Um, so we, we looked at, um, I think, one other solution, uh, which meant that we would, again, have to change our whole workflow for the warehouse. So... Um, it was then that I convinced management that the best best way to go about this, um, you know, that it might take six months to get there, but it'd be best at the end of the day if we do something in house. And so, what was that workflow? Was there, even if it's not unique, maybe just walk us through the the workflow there in the the warehouse. Um. So the so. As well as the workflow, I should mention that there was an equip equipment question as well, because we just spent about 10 grand on these uh, Windows CE scanners, which are very old, but somehow so very expensive. Um, and so uh, this other software would have required us to buy um, iPhones for the warehouse, and it would have required us to buy a scanner attachment, which was about... Um, yeah, quite a chunk of change. I can't remember the exact figure, but I think we're looking about uh, sixteen or seventeen hundred dollars per scanner. Um, and it's fine if you just have one warehouse with a couple of scanners, but when you have three warehouses um, across the world, um, it, yeah, it's quite a lot of money just to replace that six months after we've just uh, bought other scanners. So. Um, the idea at the start was to build a simple cross-platform mobile application. That was the important part. Um, but mainly we, we wanted to run it on Android and we wanted to be able to benefit from these. Um, really, look, they're, they're cheap for what they are. For, for a rugged warehouse device, they're cheap, but um, they have Honeywell images. so you're not sacrificing the quality of, of the scanning operations at all. They run Android. Uh, Android's very easy to develop for. Um, it, it costs nothing to list, or I think it costs 20 bucks once off feed us to open a developer account with Google and start publishing apps to the Play Store. Um, and the reason I went with a cross-platform development application uh, or framework is because um, rather than write something in Android that couldn't be used anywhere else, I wanted to write something in TypeScript that could be ported somewhere else. So realistically, you could actually run this uh, application in a web browser with a USB scanner and it would still work. Interesting. Or even if, if you wanted to pay the fee to go get listed in the Apple store. Yeah, if somebody well. wants to run it on, um, on iOS, they can go grab the source code off GitHub they can compile it to an iOS application and then they can deploy it from there. So ty TypeScript is like a language and then you, it's got a compiler. So how, it, how does that work? Hang on. Uh, so it's actually Ionic Framework. Um, so Ionic Framework uses TypeScript, um, Angular, and uh, Cordova as sort of the interface between the, your, your web app and your native app or the okay. native functionality. 
Um, and all that stuff is free? Yep. So Ionic, uh, they, they have some paid plans. Uh, good thing about Ionic is that you can actually do live deployment. So you don't need to, every version, everything you change, you don't need to re, you know, package it up for Android and, and upload it to the Play Store. You can actually just live deploy. They go into the app, they go to settings and they click on check for update and it will update the web code without touching the Android code. Oh, interesting. Wow. Wow, I could see how that would be really advantageous for a mobile. It's app. a very cool platform uh, for getting stuff off the ground very quickly. So I'm curious there. So to me, one of the downsides of like the Acumatica mobile app is you'll see some cool features that are coming and, you know, they, they still have to do another build until you get access to it. And, you know, I don't even know if the stuff we saw in the R2 launch is even out in the app store yet i'm curious yeah i'm surprised that i'm surprised that acumatica wouldn't use a cross-platform mobile development framework because you know maintaining two code bases it's it's not fun uh you know and there's different uh you know there's different tidbits uh in android compared to ios there's different things you need to work around so it can be quite challenging um so I'm not sure why they, they, I'm actually not sure if, even if it is a native app, I might be wrong about that. I don't know either. Yeah. It could be some central thing that automatically deploys out to both app stores. I don't know. Um, I, I'm interested there. Then did you wind up doing like two different apps in the app store? One being like a production app and one being a sandbox so that even though you're only making your changes centrally, you could at least test it out on a device in a sandbox mode? Yeah, so there's there's two channels uh, in, you can have uh, deployment channels in Ionic. So if I'm on my development scanner, I can switch the channel to, you know, unstable. Just in the app itself? Branch, without in the app itself. App. Okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so as, as long as you don't implement any new native technology um, that uses uh, other Cordova extensions, you don't actually need to deploy to the, um, Play Store or App Store. Interesting. It sounds like it, it would make it really easy to work with. Yes, it's a it's a really nice platform. I recommend anybody who's into um, mobile app development to check it out. I'll drop links to uh, to all these names you mentioned on the the episode related link section. Um, but back to the process side of things. Then, so for this particular company, who will remain nameless we like keeping things anonymous so we can go into details here um you know what what was that flow for them how things move through the warehouse yep so it's basically uh picking up a shipment with the handheld scanner um and it was uh you know using directed picking so we'd uh, on the warehouses screen in acumatica we'd um set a priority for each location it's actually different from the uh what are the different field names there's, there's picking priority, um, which is how it allocates locations to a shipment. But then we had a separate field called picking sequence. And that, that was the most optimal way that you could um, visit those locations in the warehouse. So, um, you know. It's, that was a it's, field that you guys added? The sequence correct. field? Okay. Correct. Yeah. Well, actually, priority, actually, I think, in, is a, a that was standard in the, field. In the, sorry, it is, ahead. yeah. Okay. The sequence, the sequence was actually part of the old warehousing uh, handheld scanner app. Um, I, I tried to mirror that process as much as possible. Um, so we we basically copied those fields over to new fields and we used the existing sequences. So we don't didn't need to do any configuration when we rolled this out. Um, so the the point of pick sequence is so that you're not r dashing through the warehouse to locations which are really far apart. You're, you're basically walking from one end of the warehouse to the other end of the warehouse um, in a methodical manner so that you're not double crossing yourself, if that makes Was sense. Was the problem with priority that priority is just like one, two, three and sequence is like one through whatever number you can think of? Yeah, so the priority is not all, so the priority in which it assigns locations for shipments is not necessarily the most optimal way to walk through the warehouse, if that makes sense. But like you could, could you have just used the priority field 
or it was limited maybe in terms of how many numbers it could hold. It might just be one through three. I don't remember. It's quite limited. Um, you probably could, um, but it was a lot easier to keep those separate. So every location gets its own number and they all, if you sorted them, that would be the optimal. It's, ba- yeah, it's basically like a sort order. Yeah. Okay. So you, so you added a custom field there. So if someone were to download uh, this from GitHub and I'll put a link to AccuStock on GitHub, would they need to then go add that, make sure they add that custom field on the warehouse screen? No, so the, the customization package that comes with AccuStock will add all those fields in. Oh, cool. It actually so deploys stuff fields, into like, Acumatica? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, cool, um, okay. So that customization includes custom fields. It also includes a uh, custom web service endpoint um, and also a few custom screens. Um, so for things like stock lookup, it was just more efficient to to use a custom screen than try and, try and uh, you know filter data on another screen through the API. Okay, interesting. So you scan a shipment barcode to get started on a piece of paperwork. Yeah. So there's actually a shipment barcode in AccuShip. So you can load up the shipment in AccuShip, and there'll be a barcode. You come along with a handheld scanner. You scan it. It will load up the shipment. Um, and then you click on start picking. Um, and what it does then is it assigns that shipment to that scanner so that if somebody comes along um, and opens up AccuStock and just clicks on a shipment, which is already being picked, it won't let, let them start picking that. So you're scanning off a screen. So the idea would be you still have a workstation in the warehouse where you're doing a lot of your work in Acumatica, but now you're ready to go walk out to pick stuff. So you scan. So that's one way to do it. That's one way to do it, um, but also you can just open the, the scanner and you can view a list of pending shipments. Uh, so these are unconfirmed shipments that you've created um, and you can click on one of them or you can just click on a button that, to go to the next shipment and start picking the next shipment. Okay. And we talked uh, in our eight minute conversation before we hit record, maybe it was like seven. I always like to keep that as minimal as possible so we can dive into details. Uh, on the recording, but um, you know, I asked you, is it offline? And it sounds like the, the answer is no, it's not really offline, right. but in this particular case, if I scan the shipment, could I then go complete my picking offline in the warehouse in case I lose connectivity? Correct. So um, it does depend on the setting. So uh, I think the default settings is to pre-cache all items and pre-cache all locations. So as long as you've loaded up the shipment, you can go ahead and, and, uh, walk through the warehouse and pick your items. Um, and it's only at the end that, it, uh, it, that that data gets submitted back to Acumatica. Um, okay. So you can go out of, you can actually go out of Wi-Fi range if you, if you needed to um, and keep picking and then come back into range and upload it. So it's and not fully offline, but um, you could get away with, you know, intermittent connectivity. I think that's the important part, right? I mean, it's when I'm walking the warehouse, that's when I might lose connectivity. When I get back to my station, you know, I probably have a good connection there. Yeah. So I go through and then I just scan item barcodes. I can scan quantity barcodes. What's the getting into this kind of detail yep, where so things matter? What's the flow? Okay. So you, you load up your shipment and you click on start picking and it shows you the item that you, you've got to pick and it will show you the location that you pick it from. So you walk to that location, you scan the bin barcode, and then you scan the item barcode. And say if you're picking a quantity of five shipments, um, you can choose to scan every single um, barcode, um, or you can just scan one quantity and, and enter, okay, I picked five. So it's quite flexible in that regard. When you and then you quantity, once would that be the item itself? Like if I scan the item, yeah. Twice, so if you're if you're picking five of the same um, item, so scan the item two. barcode, and that makes it a quantity of five. You can input, so you can keep, you can scan uh, five p five barcodes, or you can, or you could scan a single barcode, take five items off the shelf, put them in your your trolley, and then enter five in in the device. Gotcha. Okay. 
Now, I, was, I, I would always argue that you should scan every single barcode coming off the shelf because that's what makes this software valuable is that you're not making any mistakes. Um, who knows if somebody's put a medium in the large, large um, bin, you know? Agreed. Same thing with physical counts. It's the reason you don't print the quantities on the count sheets. So it force people to count them. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. So you do all that. It's caching all that. And then I come back and just confirm the shipment on the mobile device. Correct, yeah. Um, and there's a picked quantity field that we add to the shipment screen in MYB, and those quantity that, that picked quantity, quantity will be updated to reflect that. Okay. And then from after you do the confirming, the rest would then happen back in the normal desktop Acumatica app, including the integration you did for shipping and all that. Correct, yeah. So it sounds pretty pretty simple from a, a workflow standpoint. Any other like tweaks and things that you had to build in there to to handle that particular company's requirements? Um, it wasn't just picking. So also stock take was a big part of it as well. So there's a stock take uh, section of the app. There's also transfers. So um, um, uh, bin transfer or location transfer, um, and there's receiving but it's not quite working at the moment that that got broken a few versions ago so don't blame me for that um and there's also uh, adjustments you can do adjustments in there as well okay so oh, I, I of don't course even... of course item and bin lookup and what about uh like you say adjustments i could probably do an on the fly adjustment i notice i only have four when it says i have five what about a whole physical account processing is there anything yes, like you that can. Yeah. okay Cool. And then on the device, you mentioned, I'm not sure if I got this, you mentioned Windows CE devices. Is that the devices you owned or the devices you were going to have to purchase with the other software? Uh, that, was, that was the devices we currently owned for the software we were currently using. So even though you built this on Android, you're, you actually deployed it on Windows CE or you did go out and get Android no, we, we, we went out and bought some Android devices. Uh, the ones we bought are about 700 bucks. So, you know, price of a, price of a mid-level phone. Um, uh, very rugged. Um, have broken at least one screen, but it's very, very rare. You can drop those things from about a meter and they won't break. Um, and, they, and the most important thing is they, they have the proper uh, Honeywell images. So the scanning is really quick with them. And what exactly does that mean? You, you mentioned that before, Honeywell images. So that's just the, so I should say barcode scanner, but um, the, when you get to 2D, it's actually a, a little camera with a, with a light that reflects. Um, so it's not actually a scanner. It's, it's known as an imager. Um, yeah. Because of the QR code style, like the box instead of the rectangle? Yeah. But images, ah. images also do 1D barcodes as well. Okay. So, you, so the Honeywell images is the technology that has a more robust camera in it. Well, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Honeywell, I guess. Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 So, you know, they're, they're basically, they're, they've been in the game, that game a long time, um, building those types of devices. So um, they've gotten very good at, at, at um you know, making those devices very fast. So it's essentially the camera. I'm trying to figure out if it's hardware or software. That's sort of yes, saying. yes. Sorry, it's, it's it's the hardware. It's the hardware part. Okay, so it's the yeah. camera that other manufacturers include in their devices. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So you Which, could get a Honeywell Android scanner, but it would probably cost you about two thousand dollars or something. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'll I'll get the link to this specific device that you used in case people are are interested. Um, yeah, I would think that's the, the critical piece. I mean, if I clicking a, a button on the handheld, I'm sure buttons are pretty standard, but when I actually press the button, how fast it figures out what I just scanned, that would be the critical piece I would assume. So I, I now I understand what you mean by Honeywell images being the important part. Absolutely. And, and the important thing is that if, if, uh, warehouse staff have to wait, you know, if it takes too long to scan a barcode, they're just going to throw it in the box and mark it as done, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or they're, or they're not going to use the handheld at all, right? Yeah. So you've got to make it fast and easy for them to use. 
otherwise they're, they're probably not going to use it. Yeah, our the human race's attention span keeps shrinking. Thank you, TikTok and and other social <laughs> yes, media outlets. So, I yeah. agree. <laughs> it's a shrinking attention span. <laughs> uh, so, what about the open source part of this? So, you put this out on GitHub. You know, how, how did that conversation go about with this company? Did you have to get permission to do that, and what motivated you to do that? Um, well, actually, I actually came up with a prototype for this in in my spare time. So. Oh, over about over a few weekends um, to get it to the point where I could show management that basically this was the right route to go, and and then then I basically I basically said we can go ahead with this, but I want to want to make it open source. Um, and part of my reason uh, for that was to try and foster a, a little bit more of an ecosystem and a, a little bit more competition in that space because. Um, you know, from the solutions that I tested, they were quite lacking in um, user experience and, and just ease of use, in my opinion. And so I don't know this world very well, and I don't know if you do, but I assume open source, you know, I know there's different legal versions of open source. Could, could someone take, to, to your knowledge at least, take AccuStock and then go build their own commercial thing on top of it? and charge money for absolutely absolutely um and you know since i'm not acti actively uh developing that at the moment um you know that's what i'd like to see is for somebody to come along and and provide it as as a service even um, um so there, there's this big misconception that open source software is like freeze in beer but it's actually freeze in speech so um there's nothing in the GPL license that prevents you from commercializing it. Um, what it does stop you from doing is not providing your source code to customers. Um, so it means it means for the customer that they're easily vendor locked. Um, it means for the customer that um, you know that company could go bust and they have no recourse to keep developing or using that software. So. It's it's a lot about the the freedom of the customer, um, while also maintaining that ability to commercialize software. So, if you commercialize it, are you required then by building on top of AccuStock or using AccuStock in your commercial product? Do you know if you're required to then provide the source code for your commercial product? I wonder. It means it means if you sell that commercial product that's derived from, from my work, which is licensed under the GPL, that you would need to provide the source code to customers. Just for and the AccuStock you, piece, not necessarily for the other piece that you built, if someone built commercially on top of it. Oh, you mean the, the Acumatica customization package? Well, yeah, or, let's say I took AccuStock and I enhanced it. I don't know what I would yeah. enhance, but let's say AccuStock yeah. is a piece of my commercial product would I then be required to provide source code for my entire commercial product or just the AccuStock piece? Oh, that's a, that's a very good legal question. Um, <laughs> and we have two non-legal experts here, so we're, we're guessing. <laughs> um, it, it depends how it's implemented in short. I guess if you, if you sold AccuStock as a part or like a, a suite of tools, of applications, then you'd probably just need to provide the source code to AccuStock. Um, but if um, your other solution was somehow tightly integrated uh, or derived from, from AccuStock, then you'd probably be under liability of the, the license. And I think the other question is, who would ever find out? And, you know, how would anyone ever know? <laughs> There's the practical side of it. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. I'm sure. And, you know, it's true in the past that, um, you know, companies have sort of been caught red, red handed uh, using <laughs> open source software without uh, providing the source code. I think a, a, a good one, a good example was some set top TV box that I can't remember the name of now but they they were using gpl code and not distributing the the source code or license with it um, interesting yeah it's a problem you only have if you become wildly successful i'm sure <laughs> exactly and and you got to have the money to pay for lawyers and everything so <laughs> yeah i, I don't, I don't want to give money to lawyers so 
And I think a lot of people, they look at Acumatica. Sorry, what was that? I said, I said, take it, make it, make money out of it. But um, please, please do right by the license. (laughs) Pretty please. (laughs) Yeah, it's more of a conscience morality thing, right? Than a legal thing. (laughs) That's right. Um, You know, and if you, if you contribute to this software, um, other people are going to be- benefit, plus you're also going to benefit for, from improvements that other people make as well. Um, so at, at the end of the day, it, it means that software is developed across companies rather than by a, a single company that holds a lock and key over the source code. Yeah, when you say open source, a lot of people, I think, they look at Acumatica and they think it's open source because of the just open nature of the community and the architecture and everything, but it's, a, it's not technically open source. Uh, there's a lot of core components that you don't have access to on that point. You know, Absolutely. you mentioned something about the API as before we started recording, um, you, you, you wanted some improvements there, you know, what, what was the experience like working with the APIs and what would make I'd it I'd love better? some improvements there. Um, yeah. Acumatica is, I, I like the, the way that Acumatica has gone about it. So They've kept their core code in a black box, which, you know, which is quite unhelpful at times when you're trying to debug things or, or work around things. Uh, but at least they provided the, the screen source code. Um, I just wish they would include more comments in that source code, uh, to be honest, because uh, there isn't many, if any. Um, and uh, th- that's a real challenge when, you, when you're reading somebody else's code, um, especially w- with the, some of the complexity uh, with the graph code in Acumatica. Um, it would be nice to have some, some little hints in there. So Acumatica, if you're listening, more comments. <laughs> more comments, please, guys. What about on the API side? So like uh, the API yeah, itself, so- was that pretty open? Yeah, so this, look, I love the flexibility of the API, but it has some major performance issues. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't just in relation to um, AccuStock with, you know, I did many other integrations with, with the API. Um, and the performance, you know, I started off using the API for all our website synchronization tasks. Um, and I ended up replacing them Anything where data didn't need to be written with OData generic inquiries because they were just so much faster. Um, just for you know, pulling so, data, you mean? Just for pulling data. Yes. yes. Obviously, you're stuck with the API when you want to write data. And there's um, another big reason to do that and that you run into license limitations when you're using the API, not using the GI, though. That's another big reason to do that. Uh, well, Actually, licensing might be a di- bit different in NYB. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so you can run into licensing issues with the API as well. Um, so even with the O data, you can run into licensing. Um, I know with Acumatica, yeah, I'd, if I'd have you're to using check the, on that. A- the API, the the, and we're talking the REST API here, not the SOAP. Correct. API. Yeah. So if you're using the REST API, you could write a query to pull data out of Acumatica but it's going to count against, I don't remember if it's a transaction count or what, there's some kind of meter running on the API. And the OData right. piece does not have a meter running on it. So you can pull as much as you want over OData. Oh, you know what? Uh, that's because MYB licensing is actually per user. Ah. So okay. you actually need to assign an API license to a user in order to access the API. Got it. And then you're unlimited uh, in terms of how much you can pull. Through that user. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Oh, well, you know, I always had a sneaking suspicion that we were being rate limited, but, you know, I, I never got that information out of MYB. It would make a lot of sense in terms of the, the performance of the API um, because I possibly never worked with a slower API when it comes to pulling large data sets um, and doing, um, doing filtering on. Um, on uh, sort of non-key fields. So O data was still slow for you, but faster at least than the API. O data is a lot faster, definitely compared to using using the REST API. Um, and I believe it's it's part of the way that they've implemented the the REST API sort of over over all the graph code and screens and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it would be nice to in the future see them try and 
move away from that um, because I think that's 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 a lot of the bottleneck um, when it comes to that performance issue. Yeah, and, I'm, uh, I'm, I just I'm like to define. Dangerous. Yeah, I just like to define um, like that performance issue. Um, it's it's bad enough that we were seeing timeouts for requests uh, after 10, 15 minutes that really should have taken, you know, any SQL database, um, you know, a, a millisecond to, to execute. So, Oh, um, interesting. You know, wow. we're talking, there's obviously some code in there, which is exponential as the data set grows, right? So some nested loop somewhere, which, uh, which is just, um, just, can't ha handle those large data sets. But you didn't have that issue once you moved to O data. No, it's a lot quicker. Okay. Um, you didn't get any timeouts in the, the O data world. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Even our, even our largest data sets, we don't get timeouts through O data. It's just through the API. And then writing back, I assume you're just writing back one shipment. So you probably wouldn't run into timeouts there. Exactly right. Yep. Okay. Um, I know we're, we're running up against the top of the hour here. I know I got to let you get off to bed, but uh, before I do, I had another question on um, the, the code that you use. Uh, I want to get the links to the names that you mentioned because I can't remember them all, but to the ability to make a change centrally, I thought was very interesting, but I was curious, does it require some type of cloud piece that's running in order to make that change centrally? It does. So Ionic Frameworks provides their own uh, CI um, system, CI CD system for um, for compiling the code and then deploying it to as a live update. Um, so you have to have an account there because that's where the mobile app is talking to. No. Okay. So the app runs native, not natively on. It, it runs on the Android device. The whole. All, all the code runs on the Android device and talks directly to Acumatica through the, the REST API. Um, so the Ionic, uh, what's it called? Ionic framework um, subscription is just for the CI CD plus the, um, plus the live deployments. So the part where you said you could make a change and not have to republish to the app store, that would be making a change to the Acumatica customization project? No, that's no, that's that's one thing that you do need to redeploy um, manually. Um, so that's so you basically uh, publish a new build uh, via the Ionic portal, and that gets uh, downloaded by the handheld and applied on the handheld. So that's the part, the Ionic portal. That's the cloud piece that you have to have an account in that is running somewhere centrally, and that's what the app is talking to to get Correct, new builds. Yeah. Okay, got it. Well, cool. I uh, anything else you, you wanted to bring up? I want to respect your time and let you get off to bed. But uh, any other things about AccuStock that we didn't get to cover? Um, no, I can't think of anything. And how'd it go? Uh, being a victim here, uh, I know a developer type. It's uh props to you for for coming on and having a conversation about this uh, how was it was it, it, it was okay it was okay, it was okay. <laughs> i was a bit nervous i'm a bit sweaty now but but uh it was all right and i appreciate um you inviting me on to talk about it yeah, thanks for taking the time t t typical developer you know you, you you're great writing code but uh nervous talking about it so i'm glad that you took the time and i'm glad it wasn't too bad so any other developers out there uh, you know, who, who want to take the plunge as well. Sounds like Michael says it, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> um, Do you talk to many developers? Or, I, uh, haven't on, implementers and... I haven't on the podcast, but, um, and I, it's been a couple of years since I went to a hackathon, but, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I had a previous podcast episode with a guy named John Reed, who's like just a industry guru writer type. And yep. I thought we were talking about community in general. And the specific point that he brought up that he would love to see more of is putting business types and developers in the same room and having yeah. them talk through things. And I thought that was really interesting. He felt really strongly about that. 
Um, and I, well, I, I think totally that's, agree. That's really good, you know, about what you're doing um, is that you've got this amazing forum and I know that your posts have benefited me many times uh, while I've been developing um, and writing reports and stuff. Um, and there's a few other um, um, well-known people um, across the web, or, you know, all across the world, uh, which sort of ded dedicate their time to writing articles on Acumatica. And I'd love to see more of that in the future. Or yeah, the and even around it. I like the kit, the forums part of it. You know, Acumatica has got their own forums now, which is where most of the traffic happens. Um, I also like the in-person part of it, you know, and the one-on-one the -on -one conversation part of it. And I, I think for me, what motivates me to talk to developers, I'm not a developer. I draw the line at Visual Studio. I'll do scripting, but I'm not going to open Visual Studio. And yeah. so I'm not going to do it. But the more I talk to developers, the more I kind of get a feel for what's possible and what's like a big change versus a light change. And it's, so it's still helpful for me to, to hear that world and understand that world more because it changes how I would approach something, you know, just, just kind of having general ideas about how things work. I don't have to know how to write the code for it to be a useful conversation. Absolutely. And I think, I think once, once, once you get, you know, business types and developers together and across multiple companies, you realize that actually, you know, these implementations aren't really so different. Sure. There's, there's, you know, different things you need to do in different industries, but I'm sure um, for probably, you know, 40% of, of the challenges that we face with the, you know, Acumatica that, um, you know, we can, we can write solutions, which all of us can use and benefit from. Um, yeah, we might be in different industries. We might call things by different names, but the core problems are very similar in a lot of cases. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so what about you personally? There's no right answer on this. Uh, you mentioned you had some things you were interested in. Is it Acumatic MYOB or is it something else that can remain nameless? Yeah, so I've been working in e-commerce and, and you know, touched on ERP for about six years now. So I'm actually looking at uh, trying something else. Um, definitely in a, a software company. Um, I've spent most of my life working for companies and, and um, putting together their IT systems. Um, so now it's time to move on and, and start working for a software shop. Well, even more so. Thanks for taking the time to come on. This is the, here's the open source philosophy right there. You're giving back, even though you, you personally are going to go move on to something else. So even more so appreciate your time today. Thanks, Tim. All right. Well, that's it for now. We'll catch you on the next episode of AUGforums.com Real Talk. Thanks for listening and take care.